trick for me, Madam Commissioner. This is going to be a real short trick. Okay, hit it! <laughs> Hello, everyone. How's it going? How's it going? So, we all got up at different times today, right? We have all over the globe right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very special guest, uh, John Goodson, um, island model maker and digital artist. And uh, can't tell you how happy we are to have you on here, John. It's very oh, special to all of us. Happy to you. I'm so sorry about the time differences. <laughs> no, no, it's kind of fun actually. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> so you're in California, right? Yeah. Nine nine p.m. Jason yeah. and I are, are on the East Coast. We're at midnight, and John's the only one we gotta say sorry to. He got mm -hmm. up at five a.m. So, <laughs> yeah. but he, he he likes the punishment anyway, so it's okay. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like I said, we're we're really 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 happy that you joined us today. Um, I mean, basically, you know, we. We follow a lot of your career, and we we marvel at all the things that you've designed and built for ILM and all the movies and shows and stuff. And you have the job we all wish we had. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, why don't I let you just tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe you know how you started and maybe a few. I'm, I'm sure a lot of our viewers know who you are, but if they don't, you know, there's going to sure. be time to tell you who you are. Yeah, um, well, I started at ILM in August of 88, and when I was a kid, I started, I was living on an Air Force base next to a neighbor as a fighter pilot, and when I was like five, he got me watching Star Trek, and then shortly thereafter, somebody gave me the making of Star Trek book, and it clearly showed none of this stuff is real. Those are models, <laughs> props, sets, you know, and so, and, but I was totally fascinated with it. I'm five years old, and prior to that, there had been an episode of Lost in Space when I was three. It was called The Derelict, and it really featured the Jupiter 2 up close, and I thought that was absolutely amazing. <clears throat> and that's a funny thing, because theoretically, there was a 10-foot miniature of the Jupiter 2, which was the flying saucer that the Robinson family was lost in. And supposedly, those shots were the 10-foot miniature. And you flash forward to about five years ago, and Gary Kerr, a friend of mine, tracked that thing down, and the 10-foot does exist, and I got to go see it. So it's really uh -huh. fascinating to see something at age three and then, you know, 55 years later, go out and actually get to see the thing. It was amazing. That's cool, yeah. You know, but yeah. so I was fascinated with the stuff. And then I was at the grocery store when I was 13 and episode or it was issue seven of Starlog magazine was on the on the magazine shelf. <clears throat> and it had Space 1999 on the cover. Well, it had Star Wars on the cover, but it had an article about Space 1999. And it showed the Eagles, the ships that were on the show. And I begged my grandmother to buy me this issue because there wasn't much out there in terms of behind the scenes content. You know, there are no DVD extras, there's no internet. So this showed, you know, Brian Johnson and Nick Alder holding the different size Eagle models. And I was like, this was gold. So I begged her to buy me the magazine. She did. And that there was an article in there about this Star Wars thing. And I didn't know what it was, but it looked pretty interesting. So I was there opening day and I saw it 31 times in the theater the first time. Wow. So wow. I was there like every week, you know, yeah. and I was absolutely fascinated. I started writing letters to Island going, Hey, I want to come and work for you guys. I'm 14. I want to come work for you guys, you know, and they write me back and say, thank you so much for your inquiry. Your letters on file, please don't write us anymore. You know, but that was where I wanted to go. And the art of books had little bios in the back of them for a lot of the people that were on the, on the crew. And it looked like a lot of people were industrial design or they were architecture. So I went to NC State in product design, which is close as I get to industrial design, and hoped somehow this would all work out. And I came out to visit a friend of mine I went to, to high school with, a guy named Tony Hudson. Tony had gotten a job in the creature shop. He was working there. So I came out and spent five weeks sleeping on his couch, and they were doing Star Trek Four, and just starting on Inner Space, and Howard the Duck had just wrapped. So I was around ILM for about five weeks and got to see a lot of stuff and meet a lot of people. Got to, I got an hour interview with Steve Golly, Warren Peterson, Izo Young, Charlie Bailey, and Greg Jean. And Greg was working on batteries not included. And Greg's like, so what's going on? I'm like, well, I got a year left in school, and that, but I want to do this. He goes, go back and finish school. This is going to be a year. So that was good advice. I went back and finished school. And I came out a year later, 
and you know, hoping I'd get a job and interviewed with a couple of industrial design places down in Menlo Park. But six days after I got here, I got a call to come to ILM for a week. And so I got there and the guy who hired me was Larry Tan and they were doing body wars, which was like star tours, but you get miniaturized and put inside the human body. Okay. And so I was supposed to do a week on body wars. So I sat at the front front lobby, you know, sat off the couch out there. And Larry said, well, you know, they'll, they'll come to Steve, Bio, Steve Golly will come by and he'll get you, or Jeff Mann. And I had met Jeff when I was out there in 86 and nobody came. And I sat there and finally got to be lunchtime and people are leaving and stuff. And Larry goes walking by, he goes, did, did nobody come and get you? I was like, no. So I've been sitting here all morning and he goes, well, come with me. So I follow him and we go down the hall to the wood shop. And as we're walking there, he goes, I'm giving you to Steve Golly. And just so you know, he hates rookies. And I'm like, well, great. You know, so he just takes me to the shop and gives me hands me up, Steve. And Steve, all Steve does is he handed me this drawing. He goes, build this. And then everybody left. And I'm standing in the wood shop. I don't know where the bathroom is. I don't know where the front door is. I don't know if actually I'm working there. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so I went out in the hall and I saw Dennis Mirren, who I recognized from like, you know, the Star Wars making of stuff. And I saw him I'm like, hey, can, can you take me to the model shop? He's like, oh, yeah. So he takes me upstairs and I go in the model shop. And there was Bill George was in there. That was the only person in there. And I came in and I said, yeah, I'm supposed to make something. And he, he said, well, you can use that desk over there. So for three days, I tried to be as invisible as I could because I thought, well, when they figure out I'm in here, they're going to throw me out, you know. And on day three, I, I was out in the hall and I ran into Jeff Mann. He goes, hey, was I supposed to come talk to you? I was like, yeah, do I work here? And he goes, oh, yeah, 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 you're working here. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I did not know. But for three days, I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be invisible. I'm going to stay here as long as I can before they throw me out. So that was how I got started. <laughs> I'm sure it's not that easy these days. It's so different now. <laughs> It's such oh, a different, yeah. oh yeah. I mean, this was, we didn't have locks on the doors, you know, and it was, yeah. they had taken over an industrial park in Santa Fe and bit by bit, they took over the real estate as other companies left, but they would leave up the signage for those companies. So people thought there was a machine shop and there was a famous Amos cookies place and all these things that weren't there anymore. So, you know, people would randomly walk in off the street, wouldn't, and they wouldn't know what it was. It'd be really puzzled by the whole thing. <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah. A very different animal now. Oh, did you did you were you did you build models when before you started working for ILM? On your yeah, own? I started building models in 1969. Okay, so it was a while back. That was the first stuff I was messing around with. You know, I was like five. Put together this kid that lived down the street from us had an airplane model. He took it, he smashed it with a cinder block, and I collected all the pieces and tried to glue it back together again. That was my first model. It was this kludge pile of wreckage, you know. But that was a first kit bash. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. but you know what's funny was one of the uh, two of the other kits i got early on were these large scale the large scale aurora model kits of airplanes and one was a p40 and one was the fucker trimotor it was what the red baron flew had the three wings and these things seemed really big they they went together with screws and i thought god these they were they were huge and i've still got the box art for the p40 from the from that or, the original kit and about maybe about five years ago, I kept looking at them on eBay. I'm like, you know, I keep on, I keep wanting to buy one of these just to have it for old time's sake. And finally, one showed up and was missing a wheel and a radio aerial or something. It was like sixty bucks. I'm like, I'll buy it. So I buy it. And a week later, I come home. And there's this little box, about 10, 12 inches wide across, sitting outside the door. I'm like, what is that? Open it up. It was that plane. But this is mm. this is a story about relative scale. When I had that as a kid, I was a lot smaller, so it seemed <laughs> huge. But it was really stunning to pull it out. And it's like this big. <laughs> so. oh, fantastic. Well, yeah, I um um we all we all all three of us we love to build models. I mean, it's it's it. I just recently started maybe two years ago, and John's been doing it for a lot longer than all of us put together. Well, maybe not you, but um. Like it, it, when I was a kid, I don't know, how, I'm, you're a little bit older than I am, but uh, I never really paid attention to people behind the scenes who made these movies, you know? So for you to see, see, you know, recognize some of these people in the background, other than Carrie Fisher and all that, it's pretty, you know, cool that well, I never would have thought of that. Yeah, but it's funny. There were a lot of those making of Star Wars things that came out after the first film was so successful. Yeah. And they would show, you know, the behind the scenes, they'd show the models in front of the blue screen, or they'd show them pulling the camera back while a TIE fighter blew up. So there was, there was exposure to that stuff. So they were, they were definitely featuring it because I think people saw special effects in a whole different way with Star Wars. 
Oh yeah. And yeah. you know, 2001 predated it by 10 years more or less. And the effects in that are still incredible. But yeah. you know, you contrast 2001 with in the same year, I think the green slime came out and it's the most horrendous looking stuff. I mean, you just can't even imagine <laughs> that anybody thought this was acceptable, but you know, this is the same year. Right. So when Star Wars came out, I think it kind of shone a different light on special effects and, and it became kind of a star into itself. Right. What, what do you, um, do you, what do you prefer? Are you a huge, bigger Star Trek fan or Star Wars fan or, you know, something other than that? They paid exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Not, not yeah. to sound totally mercenary, but I like them both, you know, but for really different reasons. And I, I really enjoyed Star Trek and me. I was model supervisor on Generations and First Contact. Okay. And we built the last practical Enterprise. We built a 10 foot Enterprise E, okay. which was kind of a nightmare, but, you know, but, you know, and on Star Wars, I worked on, I worked on the special edition for New Hope, the special edition for Return of the Jedi. And then I was on all three of the prequels, then I was on Solo, I was on Rogue One, I was on Episode 7, I was on Episode 9, then I've been on Ahsoka and Mandalorian and Skeleton Crew. So I've been on a lot of Star Wars. Skeleton Crew. So, that is yeah, Skeleton Crew sounds exciting. Yeah, I'm really curious to see what it turns out like. I really like the ship. I can't say a whole lot more about it, but I really like the ship. <laughs> did you build it? I did. Okay, I, you can you answer that. Models, yeah, these models that we've been doing for the TV shows, I build those with a guy named Dan Petrasky. And Dan's a machinist and a model maker. So it's the two of us doing it, which is kind of amazing because, you know, I remember we used to have several thousand square feet and departments of people that did different jobs, and now it's just me and him. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it was um, wonderful for us to see that physical models are still being made. It's it, it's so nice for the lot from, from Mandalorian and Ahsoka and now Skeleton Crew and going right back to all these models and it seems to be you making these fantastic models that we're all falling in love with again it's it's, it's so good to see well i feel really lucky to be doing it and really lucky that we are doing it you know i mean it's definitely a, a call back to the old days because we're you know we're building miniatures we're shooting motion control and john Knowles building the motion control systems in his garage so dan myself and john jokingly refer to ourselves as three garage productions <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's, well, a, I mean, there's to see to see John's um, motion control rig that that you made for for the for Mandalorian for the Razor Crest. Um, yeah, for that one shot of it swooping past, and I'm sure many others. It it, it was worth the the hard work because it looks absolutely beautiful on screen. Well, he absolutely loves building that stuff, and I think he's on at least like generation four at this point. And so every time every season, he's got a whole new system. And like this one's got spinning LEDs and it looks like something out of the sixties, you know, <laughs> but he totally, he loves doing that. So, yeah. Yeah. When we saw that, when we saw that, I was at Anaheim, uh, oh, okay. celebration Anaheim. And it, you know, I saw that model there. Is it, was that the one you put, you made that was, that was the one that was at, at Anaheim or is there a, a second one that they had there? No, or? that's, that's it. That was you, the Razor Crest. So Dan and I built the Razor Crest, the Ahsoka ship and the light cruiser. And then they had an N1 Starfighter that was 3D printed by General Giant out of metal. That was a gift yeah, for John Favreau. That I remember. But oh. they also had the Ahsoka ship at Anaheim. Yeah. yeah. And nobody knew what it was. Oh, I knew what it I, was. Well, I stood there. <laughs> I stood there for every day of that event watching the models. And like once or twice a day, I'd see somebody go, oh, it's Ahsoka. I thought, oh, my yeah. God, I wish I had a gold star to go give that guy. Because I mean, like, <laughs> nobody's, everybody's walking by it. They don't know what it is. Yeah, so. I saw it. I fell in love with it immediately. I was just, I was blown away by it. I, I, I seen it. It was in the cartoon too. Like a quick shot of it was in the cartoon. Yeah. In fact, I have a picture of that. I was going to show, um, but I came home with a whole bunch of pictures and show. Was talking to everybody about it, and I'm like, I got to build one of these. I, I'd say, John, we talked about it quite a bit. Um, it, it just, it just, it, it, although it was wildly different to anything from sort of the OT or the original trilogy. It, it just seemed so familiar, and it it, it it just it just blew our minds. We were like, oh, "We got to build that." It's <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. I mean, it was funny because we had finished up the Lake Cruiser, and I was talking to Dave Filoni, and I said, "You know, if you want to build that ship you're talking about, now's a good time." And he sent me artwork, and as soon as he sent me the artwork, I'm like, "I've already built this before," and it was on Attack of the Clones, 
and it was a concept model that was the same thing. It was the big wing, and it had three engines on the back, and the cockpit was built into it. So it didn't have the rotating wing. It didn't have the fuselage, the, the bulges on the side, except at the back. It had the three engines. So it was, it was that design, and then he took that and incorporated some other details and made it like the T6. But it was funny. When he sent me that, I'm like, I kind of built this thing before. It's like, you know, like a foot tall. But I was familiar with the basic concept of it. So we extrapolated oh, from there. Yeah. Did you, oh, did you, okay. I, the one, I, everybody was saying they had like a question or two they wanted to ask you. My one question is, did you use kit parts on this or was it mostly 3D printed Greeblies? It's, there's a handful of kit parts on it and most of it's just handmade. Okay. The, the backs of the engines are 3D prints and the ball turret is 3D printed and there are two little round details on the sides. And I think that's all the 3D printing there is. Okay. And, it's kind of problematic because, you know, when I took it down to Celebration and I was mounting it on that rig, so it's tail mounted, those 3D print parts are so delicate and it was oh, yeah. breaking while I was trying to mount it. And I was kind of grumbling going, oh God, I don't want any more 3D printed parts. And so <laughs> when we, well, when we took it to shoot it on stage, that, that wing mechanism is really complicated and it couldn't be, you know, it'd be really simple if you could put a motor right in the center of the ship, but you couldn't because there has, there's a rod mount there. So the motor is eccentric. And so Dan had to design an engineer, an eccentric motor with a gear system out there and the electrical contacts and all that stuff. Cause there's, there's power in the wings. And so when it came time to shoot it, I'm like, I want you to be there. And not only did the wings rotate, but the upper and lower fuselage sections contracted down when the wing would rotate, they would contract down. Oh, and when wow. it would go back vertical, wow. they come back out. Well, we didn't know that. You know, they give us renders of a digital model that we work from, and they're one-to-one. -one. So they give us the printouts. That's what we build. And we probably were working on it a couple months, and I'm looking at it. I'm like, the dimensions are different over here from this. And I'm looking at it, what's going on? And I, I called Dan. I said, have you looked at this? Have you noticed this? He goes, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, pull up this drawing and pull up this drawing. And he's like, what the hell's going on? I said, I don't know. And I said, maybe I missed something in the meetings, and I hope not, but I don't know what's going on. So I called the art department, and I said, Hey, just curious about this detail. And they're like, we don't know what that is. I'm like, oh, thank God. So they went up talking to, I, I don't know if they talked to Filoni or if they talked to um, Rene Garcia, but the word came back, oh yeah, this is something Dave incorporated because he wanted the ship to be more svelte when it landed. I'm like, okay. But then Dan had to come up with a secondary mechanism that worked at the same time to, to do that. So he had a lot going on on this. Dan was really busy designing it all this. It looks huge. I mean, is that, did you, should you try and keep to about 124 scale or? Well, you know, like most TV show spaceships, there is no way in hell to fit the interior into that ship that they show no. on TV. And it's funny because the seats in the cockpit, the seats were in the digital model. So we're like, well, that's how big we'll build them. <laughs> we, got, we built them and then I'm watching the show and they show that big room that she's standing in. I'm like, Please tell me that's not inside the ship. And then it's inside the <laughs> ship. Like, uh, you can't even stand up back there. And you yeah. have that ball turret. That ball turret is really tiny. It's probably right. like 28 inches in diameter, you know. So yeah. there's a lot of, but you know, we were early on with the, with the miniature. We were way ahead of production at that point. So that's, that's what, one of those things that happens. Well, I, I really loved the design of it when I first saw it. And, and even after that. But then, like... It's almost like the Millennium Falcon from the original trilogy. So I feel that's where a lot of Star Wars like sh movies and shows miss out on is they don't have like it, they had the Razor Crest and now it's gone. You know, they have Ahsoka has this ship that is part of the show, really. It's like a mm -hmm. it's like the Millennium Falcon. Yeah, it's a character in itself, you know, and it's and it's a main environment that everybody's familiar with and keeps coming back to. And I think that that's where this actually works very well. And, um, you know, makes, makes this show even better is, you know, this ship. It's funny. Yeah, I don't want, to, don't want to destroy yeah. it like the Razor Crest. <laughs> yeah, let's not. Well, it's funny. So, you know, I was, I was down in Manhattan Beach and because we had had the VES Awards and the Razor Crest got nominated for Best Miniature and we won, which is a real surprise, but we won it. And everybody's like, you got to come over to the studio, you know, and see the setup. And I'm like, well, today, tomorrow's the day because I'm here. So we went over there. Well, I'm there. I find out they're going to destroy the Razor Crest, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> and so I, I go and I talk to Filoni, and I said, "You know, on Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry was a, he was a B-17 captain in World War II, and that same ten-person crew got in that B-17 every time they went out. 
So that B-17 became a part of the crew. And that's the function the Enterprise served on Star Trek was it was a part of the crew. And here, I said, but when they made Star Trek three, Harv Bennett was producing that. Harv flew Hueys in Vietnam. You didn't fly the same Huey. You got in whatever, whatever was available. You didn't develop a sentimental attachment to a particular one. So I think Harv Bennett found it easy to destroy the Enterprise in Star Trek three. And I said, oh, you're going okay. down the same path. You're killing one of the main characters here. I said, you know, yeah. I think you're making a mistake. And he goes, it's too late. We're doing it. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. You know what? But I got all this email from people. You tell me it's not true. I'm like, well, apparently it's true. <laughs> I saw the episode too. It blew up. I, I keep hoping they're going to bring it back in up in a season, in an upcoming season or something. That you know, it's and just too. Back, he keeps it in a jar by the door. <laughs> it <dust>. it is, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you, that's that's a good segue, John. Do you grow attachment to these models, um, or have you worked for ILM for so for so long that you realize that it's it's not part of it's just something that just is used for the show and then you move on to the next no they're all it's so funny because i tell people they're kind of like children in a way you know that you're you're always attached to them and in so much of the time these things come back over and over and over again so you never really get rid of them because they keep they want to do something with it or it needs to be repaired or something so you, you keep revisiting them and you know i'm frankly when these are done i'm really glad when they leave the house you know, and they're not in, they're not in the house anymore. They're gone. That's a kind of like your feeling. kids. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of the same kind of thing. You know, but, so it's just kind of, it's a relief when they finally leave. But yeah, I, I think I'm attached to all of them. I don't think there's anything. I don't know. Little That's piece of, every time you build something, there's a piece of you in it. Kind of. Yeah. Quite literally yeah. when you cut yourself with the, with the hobby knife. Well, yeah. there's the sacrifice <laughs> yeah. to the gods. There's gotta be a little bit of blood. Yeah. The yeah. last two jobs I've done up here, I drilled, a, I put a three eight inch drill through the side of my thumb and burn the insides of both these hands on, on two different jobs. I'm like, well, there's the sacrifice there. Yeah. So, I haven't quite every single hands yet. <laughs> every single model I've ever done has a little bit of my fingers skin peeled off yeah. in some sort yeah. of, I always, yeah, there's a little yeah. bit of me so, in every time. I couldn't I get fingerprinted kind of by the police because my, my, my skin on my thumbs are on the models on the super glue. <laughs> Yeah, um, John. What 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 paints are your preferred paints to use? Uh, are you do you stick to one particular brand, or do you go back and try and use equivalent of what they used in the seventies with Floquil? Or uh, well, it's funny. I still got a lot of Floquil, and I still use that, but very hard to get. I think it's been out of production for at least fifteen years. Yeah. And but it was such good paint. And but these days, for all the stuff we've been doing for the shows, I've been using house paint. Oh, really? You know, yeah. Mm. House paint. Using Rust-Oleum like automotive primer. Rust -Oleum. <laughs> uh, some of it's bare. Some of it's yeah. been, I think it's, what is it, uh, Benjamin Moore. But, and I'm really surprised because, like, the light cruiser, that model was five feet long. And I painted that with an interior flat. But I'm like, you know, this stuff's supposed to be good for 15 wow. years. Good enough for this. But what was fascinating was we we're doing this shot of it where it comes right by camera, cruises by. And there is this glint that tracks all the way down the side of it, this bright, hot little glint. And I thought, God, that's amazing. That is flat paint, but it looked amazing. It has such great scale to it. And I'm like, well, wow, house paint worked pretty good. So, yeah. you know, plus it's, it, you can get it endless quantities and you can get whatever color you want. And so that's, that's what I've been using of late. And they'll mix it up for you too. Oh yeah. Well, I go <laughs> in with a color, I go with a color, I have a color reader and I'll pull a color and go, it's Sherwin Williams 76, 764 or whatever it is, and then mix it. So yeah. I say we I say we start building all our models with, with Sherman Williams too, John. What do you think? Yeah, Sears Weather Beater. Beater. <laughs> Sears Weather how does that Beater. work? Guaranteed how does that work in, how does that work in your airbrush? Like does it does it you thin it fine. out pretty good? It works fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah so far. I would assume it's very smooth because it's just like those um like, you know, if someone's doing home painting, they wear the backpack with a large sprayer. Oh, it's yeah, just yeah. small, smaller scale, basically. Yeah. You just have to thin it out enough so it'll go through the brush, okay? Yeah. So, but, so speaking of that light cruiser, that was just a phenomenal model, John. That was joy. I don't know how we got it done. <laughs> when I saw it at, at Celebration at Anaheim, I looked at it and I thought, I don't know how that happened because that was, that was during the pandemic. And I mean, you know, I'm just here for I don't know, a year and a half of what it was. And I was working on that thing. And there are plenty of days where it's pretty hard to get motivated. Cause it's like, well, I don't know what the hell's going to happen. Is the world going to end? Who knows? You know, but, but did, did you do the majority of that by yourself, John? Uh, Dan 
Dan Petrescu, he made the armature and then he built the back end, the back part of the engines. And he did 3D prints for like the guns. See those gray boxes that are up there on the side? These here? Yeah, yeah. right there. Those, those are 3D prints. They're 3D prints scattered around on it, but a lot of it's scratch built. I'd say wow. I'd say 85% of it's scratch built. But yeah, John, if I remember correct, if I remember correctly, you were saying that you would just use a bunch of random kits you had collected over yes. however many decades. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Fawn Davis closed his shop up here a few years back and he gave me bankers boxes just full of parts trees. And so oh, wow. there's random stuff of I don't know what the hell it is. It's just, you know, parts that look good. So I'd sit there and go through those boxes and I'd make these tape strips and I would find left and right pairs and just glue all the left and rights down. And oh, nice. get as many of much of that as I can get together for you know the symmetrical stuff and then random stuff for the side side details. But like that bridge, that was a pain in the ass to make by hand. To understand understand the, the printout and then actually make that. that was, and it was interesting too because the interior, you know, in the past when we did these, you we usually just made the windows glow. And we were getting down to we're a couple of weeks away from when we we're gonna shoot, and John Noel said, I think we're gonna need an interior in there. And I'm like, hmm. What am I going to do for that? But I left the bridge wings left and right on the back. There's a door that snaps in and out. It's a snap fit. And it's about five eighths of an inch tall, maybe an inch and an eighth wide. And so I took some half inch acrylic and a Dremel tool. And I just carved out these shapes of like consoles and stuff like that. And then I carved out an area for a, it was a five, it was a nine millimeter, no five millimeter LED. So I made a centerpiece and two outboard pieces. And then routed LEDs up into it, and then I just painted the acrylic silver, and then painted the black, and scratched it off, and used Sharpie to add some color to it. And it looks really interesting when you see it. You don't know what it is. It looks complicated, but you know it's total bullshit. It's not. But <laughs> it works. Yeah. It does what it's supposed to do. And here yeah, we like, are. It looks like a tight space too. And here we are trying to get every detail like perfect, exactly the way it should be, and then you're just dremeling scratches on on acrylic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's crazy. That's the difference. That's just between doing it for yourself or as a hobby, and then you know yes. having to meet the needs of the production within the time frame. Yes, I like these these sides here. They they remind me of you know they're obviously reminiscent Falcon. of Falcon. Yeah, Falcon. Falcon. Yeah. yeah. Dan three D printed those, and he three D printed that door like thing that's forward. Yeah, this here. That, that gadget right there. Yeah. So, but yeah, those Sweet. definitely, they definitely. Now, John, when you when you say 3D printed, what particular materials are you using in the studio for 3D prints? That's Dan's stuff. And I think he's using a Form Z. Okay. Okay. If that's correct. And the, 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 acrylic, the material, I don't know what it is. It's gray and it's very high resolution, but it is really brittle. Oh, so it is brittle. Dry. Yeah, that was. That, that was my question. I'm actually um, working on this particular ship now. It's not anywhere near as detailed as this, but it's a, a 3D print that somebody had done and somebody yeah. had sent over. It. And I, I just, I got to say, I was, I was having the darnest time trying to get certain things to work and, and you know, just even taking a Dremel to it, just everything was kind of shattering like glass. And exactly. so I didn't know if exactly. there was a different type of, yeah. No, and that's that's one of the problems too. Is it's really hard to work with, and you know the Razor Crest. Now Landis Fields printed that, and I think that was also an early Form Z, and but it was fairly low resolution, so there were a lot of build lines in it, and you know it was printed at all different angles. So these things had lines going all over the place. It was like fifty-two individual pieces, and so and they were like the expectation I think was that we could just glue the three D print together and shoot that. And I'm like, hey, there's no way in hell that's gonna work. Because you gotta have mount doors, you gotta cut out mount doors. They gotta fit exactly. You try and cut the mount door out of the thing, the part explodes. I'm like, yeah. this just doesn't work. Yeah. So I'm gonna put it all together and just blasting with sandable primer and sanding and going back and forth, back and forth till I got the build lines out. Because it was gonna be skinned in aluminum. All those build lines are gonna telegraph if they were there. So once I got it to the point where it looked decent, it was fairly smooth, made a big two part mold of it, then recast it with epoxy fiberglass. Then I cut out my mount doors and everything else, kick it across the room now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so you, you, you oh, cast it after, after you got it ready. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. yeah, I was going to say, even for hero shots, how does that work? But that, that process makes makes a lot more sense. Okay. Yeah. So, well, it's funny. The skeleton cruise ship, no 3D prints. It's all handmade. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Nice. 
which is a lot more forgiving as well, right? If you need to make repairs, if something gets damaged during shooting and things like that. Well, that one's pretty forgiving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you do? Does the three D print like uh, start sagging or melting when you have it under I, lights? I, you know, I've never see. We don't build anything big enough okay. to see it do anything like that. But I've seen plenty of study models and that sort of thing that just sit there and just sag, and that's just mm. normal gravity. Some yeah. you know normal conditions yeah. and it just doesn't hold up that well so yeah I'm so, not, so john you prefer to go back with over a wooden frame with styrene and use original styrene parts if that was your go-to uh, option uh, yeah, aluminum frame hexel preferably you know and then beef it up where you need to for the mount rods and that sort of thing so but, but, you know, but, 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 but the materials you're working with you prefer to work with styrene and yeah. the original kit yeah styrene yeah. Kit parts, you know, if I can get them, uh, yeah. acrylic sometimes, you know, and then castings, urethane castings. Um, yeah. yeah. Some epoxy putty. I use a lot more of that than I used to use. So, Do, uh, what is your favorite ship you've built? Wow. Do you have one? That's, that's, that's a, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of things to consider. There's a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I really like the skeleton cruise ship. And that's one of the, because mainly because probably the most recent one okay. that's a new build. But I like them all. I mean, like I said, they're kind of like children. I'm kind of like, Are you involved to... in Acolyte at all? No. No. Okay. Nope. So far, skeleton crew is the last thing we've done. And right now, you know, they've talked about some more stuff potentially, but I haven't heard anything okay. yet. And the skeleton crew. It's lovely crew that, that they're, they're using the, the, the miniatures again. It's, 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 it's and, it, and you can tell when when they're when <clears throat> when you see the miniatures on the screen, you can, it just feels it feels nicer. It feels homely and how you remember it. You know the original well, it used to be. It's interesting to watch though what they're doing because they're you know they used to take the models and they would scan them, and now they call it scanning. They take like you know several thousand images, and they're using an AI software to stitch all this stuff together and make a three D model, and. John Noll was saying, he said, you know, I try and take, we shoot the, the physical model. It tends to look better than the digital. And then he goes, I beat them until I can't tell them apart. Mm. You know, mm. well, your crew must just love you. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, <laughs> well, yeah. What was it like, John, with the making the switch from model making in-house to CGI in the early 90s? How, how did you feel when that bombshell sort of fell when your no. whole career changed and now you're sort of revisiting it in a way does that make sense like yeah yeah well it's, it's it's the whole thing's been really interesting to me because i started off in photochemical practical transitioned into digital and then went back into at least the practical miniatures and then the same shooting processes without film so it's been an interesting thing to kind of go to see it all change from photochemical practical into all this digital stuff and then to go back and kind of like step back in time doing what we were doing 15, 20 years ago. So, but you know, the transition to computer graphics, I, you know, I didn't do email really. So it was, it, we got a month's <laughs> worth of training and what I was doing, I was doing digital paint. So I wasn't really modeling. I do modeling a little bit on occasion, but mostly it was paint. And I dripped and pulled down menus for about six months. I mean, it was overwhelming <laughs> trying to keep up with it all. And it seems so complicated. And, you know, within a couple of years, the software is changing again, sort of relearning the process. And over time, we finally, the last thing I worked in was uh, Mari. And that was a really different approach to it. Because instead of like mapping photographs onto it or, or painting in Photoshop and applying that to the model, in Mari, you actually applied materials. And so mm -hmm. you could paint, you paint the whole model white and say, that's a layer of brushed aluminum. And then I create another layer and I'll, I'll say it's, it's, they call it clay. I'll rename it primer, paint the whole thing with a layer of that over the brushed aluminum. And then like a, like a medium gloss car paint, put that over the top of that. So as long as you paint it white, it becomes that material. So now I can go back on that car paint layer and I can take black and paint it onto that. And those scratches will reveal that primer layer. Oh, and wow. you can go back and you can go through that primer layer down to the, to the metal. So it was better than working on a real model. I mean, it was yeah. really, the, the level of control you had was phenomenal. And, and the, the results, 
Yeah, I mean, I painted the U-Wing and the Y-Wing on Rogue One, and I had a blast because wow. me on the Y-Wing, where the, there were the copper pipes that are on the back, and I actually put solder, solder joints in there with discoloration. I mean, I had a field day with that. It was nice. amazing. So, well, so, and then there were times, you know, when I got more comfortable with the tool set, you, it, then it becomes just that. It's a tool set. You're making the same aesthetic choices. You know, so you're just your tool sets changed into something different. But, you know, and then I got frustrated with doing practical because it was a hell of a lot easier to fix stuff or mirror it in digital. Mm -hmm. so yeah, well, plus the, the, the size, right? So if you're doing practical and you're working on something very small, yeah. you, you know, visually, you're not able to, to zoom in and, and get that you know, yeah. finer detail that you could when you, yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting making that transition. Cause most people, not most, but I would assume some people would him and haw find that a challenge. Um, but you know, cause you're, you're teaching an old dog, new trick, so to speak, but then you yeah. get used to this new tool and then you're kind of going back again, which isn't a bad thing, but you're right. You're, you're kind of losing some of those elements that you got used to. So yeah, that's, it's, it's just interesting to hear from a firsthand perspective. Yeah. Well, it's all about transition. Yes. Plus, it's yeah. a lot easier to fix something that you messed up. Yeah, well, yeah, a lot yeah. easier. Yeah, <laughs> not trying to paint white over black or something like that, or you know. But yeah. it was funny. I went. I talked to a tenth grade class a while back, and I said, "You know, you're going to grow up in a world where you're probably going to use computers, and you know, every so often the computers will get updated. Maybe every five, six years, you know, you get new computers. But I said, two or three times between new computers, your software is going to change, and you got to really learn your job." And you're going to be on this sort of technology treadmill for the rest of your life. Yeah. And that's yeah. the reality of digital, you know? Yeah. It's like they yeah. keep, well, we change. We, I love when they put out the new release. It's like, well, the new release is basically a paint job because the button that said start over here now says go and it's over here. It's the same thing, you know, but there's a lot of that crap where I'm like, they're selling their software, you know, and they're, it's kind of a, kind of a scam, I thought. I mean, they're definitely, yeah, yeah especially, but... especially when you get used to like shorthand keys or, you know, shortcut oh, yeah. things like that. Yeah. The things that you they, like use regularly. Yeah. Yeah. And then they change it all. It's like, what was the point of that? <laughs> yeah. You, you just got to go two more menus in to do the same thing. Yeah. 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 Hmm. I, find, so, I always find that stuff interesting because even with the, the practical effects guys, the stop motion guys, they all, everybody seems to have, have to add, had made that transition right and a lot of them did so graciously you know maybe maybe with a little bit of resistance um but i always wonder when we haven't talked to many people that haven't made that transition or you know became so like resentful of it or just found it too challenging to actually do so so it is interesting that people are able to carry that skill set over yeah well i mean it's the aesthetic is still the same you know i mean that's, yeah. that's one of the things we always talk about was you know, people develop an eye. And, and it was funny, when I got in the model shop, I kind of thought I knew how to paint models. I did not know how to paint models and especially didn't know how to paint them for film. And, but it was so interesting being with that group of people, it sort of homogenized us because you learn from everybody around you and mm. you kind of learn what looks right. And there's that whole thing about, you know, soft focus your eye and look at it. Is there enough detailers and enough contrast there? You know, and, and you learn how to do that. And it's really interesting how it kind of cross pollinates throughout the whole group that we yeah. all learn what that look is, you know, what we're after. Yeah. So. Look, that's it's, really interesting. We, we try and we, as best we can replicate the ILM paint look uh, as, mu as much as we can. But you said, were, were you taught um, uh, by your peers when you went into, you know, the, at the model shop, but uh, you said you weren't sort of. Um, immediately a fame with it or you thought you knew how to paint and yeah. how, how long did it take for them to to, to, to sort of I, I think what i'm getting at is them sort of like just pushing your airbrush away and then saying this is how you do it they, <laughs> no nobody ever did anything like that but you just watched everybody you right know? Mm. and you got a sense of what they were doing you know and so because i don't think anybody wants to go i have no idea what the hell i'm doing everybody you know, right. it wants to be that guy. So, but, you know, but you, you watched everybody. And one of the nice things too, and I found this to be true in the computer graphics department and the model shop was that people would help you. People were not protective of their secrets. You know, you wanted to learn how to do something, somebody would show you. And I always kind of have this imaginary, you've got this like satchel under your arm. And every time somebody gives you one of those things, you put it in your satchel. It's another tool you got. And yeah. man, you learn so much working in the model shop. And 
different shows, it was a different look or, you know, going for something different. Maybe this show's got more organic stuff. Maybe this is Transformers, you know. It was just, it was constant learning. And I always thought it was really interesting that there was always something. I always called it the hook. Every show had something that was the hook that was interesting. So no matter what it was, I'm like, I'm sure there's something in there and there would be. You know, that was Give us an example of that. Give us an example. Oh, well, well, gosh, I'm thinking about Transformers. I just remember my, my transmission, my truck disintegrated essentially. And the guy called me up and I thought I had a bad wheel bearing, which I did. But the guy calls me up that night and he goes, hey man, your transmission's over here in the pan. I'm like, really? So I went over to look at it the next day and there's the front end of the transmission with the planetary gears. And there are chunks out of all four of them. There are pieces gone all over the place. And I was like, can I, can I have this? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> so I took it back to work. And we used this reference for Transformers just because it was such a great example of what this broken machinery looked like. But, you know, it was, you know, movie might have Navy ships in it, something I'd find interesting, or there would be something to focus on that you wanted to learn more about. Mm -hmm. And this was this thing, when I was in design school, I remember they gave us one, one of the projects was a bar of soap. I'm like, who the hell wants to draw a bar of soap? For the next four <laughs> weeks, we're gonna do a bar of soap. Well, then you realize, you know, when you're, you start looking at bars of soap and you realize how many different kinds of soap there are. Yeah. And indeed, there's every kind of shape, color, texture, you know, and you start realizing all the stuff you've never, ever seen before, you know? And so this is the same kind of thing where there's stuff you look at. And that's all part of being an artist too, is trying to look at these things and try and take in all those variants to it. We did doorknobs once, same thing. It's like, holy crap. Once you open up your eyes to doorknobs, you realize they're different everywhere, you know? Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. The awareness, so, right? You you take for granted a bar of soap, but then it really makes you self aware, uh, like you yeah. said. So the thing I always found, I didn't mean to deject like that, but yeah. to continue on that direction, the thing that I, I find interesting, did you ever find it a challenge? So let, let's say you're working on, a, let's say Star Wars, right? And then you go to Star Trek or Transformers. It's a complete different aesthetic. You, you yeah. tend to get, as a creative, you get in the zone, right? You're in the zone and you're painting a specific way or style. And then you have to now shift or change that. You ever find that to be a little bit challenging or find yourself kind of using one style and, and having to. Well, it was, it's interesting because, you know, doing Star Trek, cause I did the paint with Ron Woodall on the enterprise on the first JJ Star Trek movie. You know, it's funny cause what I was going for was kind of the motion picture look and I got as close as they would let me, they were, they were kind of, they wouldn't let me put a red stripe down the nacelle. But other than that, I kind of got what I wanted. But, you know, you, you're doing different. You know, I had to detail, like, at the fantail outside the shuttle bay. I had to detail that. I had to detail right outside the bridge window because it's shot right outside the window. And there's a look that Star Trek kind of has. Yeah. You know, and then Transformers is this whole other thing. It's much more mechanical. And my favorite resource for the, for the Transformers movies was the Reno Air Race. And I'd go up there mm -hmm. in the pit. And, you know, a lot of contemporary military aircraft were the best for the mm. kind of the wear and tear and discoloration and that sort of thing. Cause you could literally take the photographs and map them onto stuff. Oh, but wow. I remember, well, I remember I was working, I, I do work with the battleship Iowa, which is in Southern California. <clears throat> and we were out in one of the mothball fleets getting parts and there was a ramp. And it's just a piece of steel and it's flat on top and it's angled on either side. It's for the forklift to drive over the cables without cutting the electrical cables. And mm. we're moving stuff and all of a sudden, everybody stop. And they're like, what? I'm like, I gotta take a picture of this. And they're like, what? And I said, I gotta get these scratches, you know? So I photographed the scratches on this piece of steel. That set of scratches is on everything that I worked on probably in the last six or seven years I was at ILM. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> well, in an un unbroken, there would be 24 crashes. It's all over the B24 Transformers. It's all over those. It was all over anything that got distressed had that set of scratches on it. So yeah. yeah, there were there were things that, you know, that was my favorite scratch pattern. Yeah. You know, but so you just layered it over top of it on digitally. You you could take yeah. it and you know what I did was I took everything out except the scratches. And so I just had this okay. transparent layer. And then you could convert it to black or white, whatever you wanted to do. And in that Mario program, shift it. Shift put it, it right on top of it and yeah. suddenly you've got scratches through to your undercoat so yeah yeah that, that's so interesting so like when you look at let's say you know music production sound design you know you'll have some bands that if you, you pay close attention 
there's that certain snare or, or you know three part drum that they like and they use it in almost every song but you don't necessarily notice it until yeah. it's pointed out to you so it's one of those things now i i bet if somebody goes back and watches you can start to see those similarities now that it's pointed out you kind of you know so that, that that's great that once you find something it becomes like a go-to that's yeah, yeah. well you kind of have your bag of tricks you know you get new stuff yeah. too you go to the go you used to go to the air races every year get more images and stuff like that or random things like on the ships there's a lot of stuff i found that found on the ships that was really useful so yeah, or is that, that certain, nothing, nothing beats more real than real does it you know yeah well was, i was teaching a model class for lucas i think it was for lucas arts and the battleship io was up in northern california at that point it was there for about eight months before it moved down south and i said you guys all need to come over and come on the battleship because this is as close as you'll ever get to a star destroyer this is the okay. real thing you know, they come and see what this looks like you know so yeah. yeah that's what i was doing the other the other day john i was sending you pictures of the inside of a an old 1970s um uh coal um power plant i felt like i was walking around inside of a sand crawler like i took pictures <laughs> just so i could copy some of the pipe work and some of the different boilers and stuff and, and yeah i actually remember yeah john i sent you those pictures remember yeah, yeah. well and then when you said about pipes and that i mean when you when you're greebling something up and putting the parts on and you, you need to make it look like it's functional right you need to yep yeah well that's that the whole mechanical language thing you know and yeah, it was interesting because teaching the, the class, you know, we gave everybody some kits and we said, you know, try this out and, and you know, do your version of kit bashing. And it was really apparent some people got right off the bat. A lot of people just glued stuff on that really made no coherent sense. Yeah. yeah. And you're trying to convey a mechanical functionality. And this, it was funny because there was something, it was one of the articles about Ahsoka and it was talking about, it said Coley Wurtz and I were co-designing the ship. We weren't. Coley was designing the ship, but it was the the cargo ships they had in Rogue One. They kind of looked like a big sea turtle. And the fins would go vertical when they were landing. And okay. Coley and I were talking about it, and you know he was saying, "Oh, you know, what do you think? What, what do you think the top should look like?" And I said, "Well, I put some kind of a rack system on top of it because it's a cargo vessel. You got this big flat deck. You'd want to put something up there that makes sense. So maybe you've got like a rail system." And maybe the idea is that containers could be put on this thing and locked down, but you double your, your capacity. And I said, you know, you can do something like that and you don't have to explain it at all. If it makes sense, that will telegraph through. Nobody else yeah. has to know why, what it is or how it works, but if it makes sense, they'll, they'll pick up on it. And I think that's true. And I think, you know, you look at the way that the, the details are put on the sides of the Millennium Falcon, where there's a detail band on the back of the X-Wing right behind the R2 unit. Yeah, it's done thoughtfully in such a way that it actually looks like it has a function to it. Yeah, and that's that's, that's an art form in itself. Yeah, it really is. And yeah. you, know, you go back and if you look at Star Crash, and Star Crash is available on Netflix right now under the Mystery Science Theater three thousand banner, which is perfectly appropriate for it. But there, they just made these shapes, and it literally looks like they put glue on them and they rolled them through some kit parts. No, really. <laughs> there's no, yeah, there's no real thought to it or anything. It's just this jumble of stuff and. They were trying to mimic Star Wars. It was right on top of Star Wars. So they were trying to mimic Star Wars, but without any of the finesse or the detail or any of the stuff that made Star Wars really work. Because Star Wars, you know, Jerry Anderson, Jerry Anderson did the things like Thunderbirds and he did Far Side of the Sun and he did UFO and Space 1989. But the early stuff that he did with Derek Meddings, and Derek Meddings was famous for working on the Bond films, doing miniatures. But Jerry Anderson it was the first place I really saw a lot of kind of kit kit parts and weathering. I saw some, there's some of it in 2001. It's interesting because the Ares was the that's the only surviving miniature from 2001: A Space Odyssey. And I worked with some folks and we refurbished it for the Academy Museum. And it's interesting because it has a you know a handful of kit parts on it that are on the upper body. Got a lot of kit parts on the engines, but there's all this oil that's leaking out of it everywhere. And I'm like, we were working on it. I'm like, you know what? I wouldn't get in this damn thing if it was real. There's no way. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's done It's done to sell it that it functions. But, you know, you look at it like, you know, that you turn this thing out, it just blow up. I mean, it's just yeah, leaking yeah. stuff everywhere. But yeah. it's it's cinematically, it, it reads and it, and, it, and it sells it as being real. And it was funny, when we did the first Transformers, the initial direction was to make the robots clean. They didn't have any weathering on them. And we did that. And we did the first renders. It was like, oh. 
good lord they look like these totally artificial big plastic things yeah. and, and then then the word came down no no weather them up beat them up scratch them up beat them you know so we beat them all to pieces and then that sells it you know it makes yeah. all the difference in yeah. terms of a senior real makes it the world makes it more yeah. real world yeah well and that was the beauty of being able to take photographs of stuff and actually pull in those real world elements and map them onto the models you know you really got that yeah. believability with it it i find it i find it difficult sometimes when i'm like like right now john and i are both doing this concept at concept that at that joe rob john joe johnson had drew up and trying to get your machinery to look like it functions is is an afford, is a pretty hard thing to do sometimes when you especially when you're trying to go through a hundred kit boxes to try to find something that would work in this little spot and yeah. you know it doesn't look completely out of place and it's fun but it's it's a lot harder than most people think it is it is yeah. and, and 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 then finding um multiples of the same kit if you're not yes. recasting the part to, yes. to, to, to replicate it and it, um, funny, me and Chris, we have, we have literally not been talking about this. We have been the, on our desks with vintage kits open and we've been pilfering these models. And we've come up with the same kit parts in the same areas. It's funny how your mind works. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that is interesting, yeah. 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 Well, there's some of those yeah. kits. They're those go-to kits too. They're like the rail guns. Yep. And I've been yep. buying, what are the 88 millimeter, the, that small gun? A lot of good yeah. stuff in there, yeah. But the yeah, fuck? a lot of those kits, they're phenomenal. They're it, they're such a great source, you know. They yeah. are. It gives you the instant eight credibility. Rad, eight rad Harrier, yep. you know, they're all they're all really go to kits that, that are on just about everything. And but because they they're on everything because they have such cool functional looking pieces that that aren't like you know a, a battery or a or a transmission pan or you know what I mean. So it's it they work great. It's, it's funny. It's, it's, Yep. Sorry, John, go on. Oh, just the sand crawler. It's really interesting to me the use of the Saturn V kit in the back end of the sand crawler. Mm -hmm. I mean, they made maximum, <laughs> made maximum use out of just about every piece back there. Yes, but they it's did. Interesting how it, it's reconfigured, turned, and cut, and everything else. But it's really amazing what they did. Yeah, I'm building one right now from kit parts. It's, it's, really? I got the, I got the top back done and the middle, the middle top done. And I'm about to start the back, but. I'm, I'm I'm waiting for a little bit till I finish something else. But you, you and I need to talk. Yeah, we can talk. Are yeah. you doing one too? I've been picking at it for a long, long time. Okay. Yeah. All right. But well, you, listen. Yeah. You can join our. You can join our little group builds. We have we have group builds that that we just go on. The three the three of us and, and four of us actually. Marvin, another guy who who hangs with us a lot. His name's Marvin. He's a very smart guy. He we we jump online and we just we just start building together so because it helps to figure things out when you're when your mind sees yeah. something that you know you can't figure it's good to get another person's perspective to 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 you know give you a, a another set of eyes to it you know yeah well kind of like what you were saying earlier john like when you're in a when the, when you're in that environment and you start picking up you know those sort of habits and and you know skill sets of other people and you start bringing that into your tool set so yeah putting a fresh yeah. perspective fresh set of eyes or just learning like you know oh this is how john's doing it maybe i should try that approach or this yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think it's, that, it's it's a great way of, of going about it yeah we, so we, 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 we sat and made the walkway didn't we chris the, the same called a walkway we sat on a video conversation like we are now and and chris is saying oh, john stop don't put that there you know that there could be a bit more <laughs> and we've um, and we and the same with the slave one. We we've made so much progress by banging heads together on the screen yeah. than if we would have done privately on our own. Yeah, well, three three heads is better than one. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Yeah. Uh, John, you're, you you um, is it okay to mention you're you're repairing some of the original models at the moment? Is is that is that still something you're working on? I don't. I don't know how well that's known or yeah I, I, I don't know that I can comment on that okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. maybe I should have asked you privately about that <laughs> it's okay sorry no. <laughs> privately <laughs> yeah well another well, thing I wanted to ask you is welcome to join our, um, our little group builds anytime you feel like it yeah, yeah what do you, well, how do you coordinate the time oh 
Well, so I usually, that usually ring works out. Like I usually jump on in the morning before breakfast. Yeah, when he when I'm waking up, he's already. I can't tell you how many phone calls I've gotten at seven a.m. because he's five hours ahead of me. You know, my wife's <laughs> like, "Is that John again?" And he forgot again. So, do, yeah. you, do you guys know Wayne Minnie? No, uh, no. That sounds familiar. Yeah, he just did. He just did a four foot Enterprise D for the Sci Fi Museum that's in it's in England somewhere. Okay. And I, saw, oh. I don't I don't I don't know Wayne, but I I, I think I, I think I saw images of that. Yeah, he posted a bunch of stuff on online about it, and you know it's funny because he was doing that at the same time. I had the four foot D from Next Generation, which had had fallen on some pretty hard times, and it got shipped to me about three or four years ago, and it looked so bad. I would just look at it and be like, oh, it just made me feel bad. I didn't know where to start, and finally they actually needed the model, so I started working on it in earnest. And Wayne was working on this set. Of, it was a set of castings of Greg of the same model. Of Greg Jean's model. So Wayne was working on it and we would talk almost every night between two and three in the morning my time because that was <laughs> when I'd be ending my day and we're yeah. comparing notes and we're trading parts back and forth. He had some of what some of it, I had some of it, you know, and both of ours are done now. But yeah, it's kind of interesting every night going, so what about the deflector dish? Okay, I can send you a casting next Tuesday. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes that's, that's, it's, it's, it's pretty sad, actually, that you get, that when you'll be late at night and then you'll finally find a piece that you're looking for and you, you can't sleep and you're saying, I found it, I found the ID. <laughs> when, when, we were doing, when we were doing the 2001 model, there was a part and it was on the left engine on screen and it was a round disc that was about you know, an inch and an eighth and, and you could see it on, on screen, but you couldn't tell much about it. And there, we didn't. We had really good imagery for a lot of that model, but we were missing about a ten-inch section of it. And so that was in our ten-inch section. And I was looking at a book. There were two books written by um, Adam Johnson called *The Lost Science of 2001*. There was a red book and a blue book. And in the red book, I think on page 28, there was a picture of the Aries, about the size of a softball, and you could see the part, but because of print resolution, you couldn't make it out. Oh, so God. I was like, so I I tried to find Adam through the publisher, couldn't find that. But then I found AJK Models, which was a 2001 garage kit company. I'm like, that's got to be him. So I wrote him, and like within an hour, he's like, I was wondering when you were going to call. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so we started talking about it, and he was going to get us the images of that because they were, they were you know, the clean images without the print resolution issue. But before we actually got that stuff, I woke up at like two or I think it was about two in the morning. I woke up one night, and I was, I was thinking about that part. And we had one view of it from underneath. There was a shot directly under the Aries. And you could see it was kind of a dome in these little tabs. Okay. So I took out all of the kits I had accumulated for the Aries. I got a bookcase. It's just Aries kits. Took them all out. Took one of each down on the coffee table. Took all the parts out. Went through the whole thing. It was none of those. So then I got online. And I went to eBay UK. And I put in vintage model kit. And on page 52, it showed up. And I should have known. I missed the clue. The clue was that there was a terracotta red in the glue that was left on the model. And that should have been a hint. And what I got confused with was there was an Airfix B29 kit that had a pressure bulkhead in it. That pressure bulkhead was used at all the connecting points for the landing gear. So there were 16 of those on the lower part of the model, and there's one up in the top of it. And it was the right size. And I'm like, but that was cast in white or gray. So I should have known then that wasn't it. But when I saw page 52 on eBay, I realized, I was like, oh, shit, there it is. It's called a Pressman dual silo train car. It's also on the moon bus. And it's a little Airfix HO scale train car kit. And it's the cap. It's got two of these caps. And that was the part. And I knew as soon as I saw it, I'm like, that's it. So <laughs> about 4.30, I got to go back to bed, you know. So I saw yeah, page 52. Part. That's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, page 52. I remember it all very clearly because it was one of those stress things where you wake up in the middle of the night, can't sleep anymore. It's like, I need to go figure this out. But what a great feeling when you find that ID and you've, and you've got oh, it. Yeah. yeah. And I had one. I had one. <laughs> oh, wow. Because I was setting aside parts to build a moon bus. And as soon as I saw it, I'm like, I went and got it out of the closet. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Oh, fantastic! Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, quite often, nine times out of ten, the model is 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 on there anyway in a different form. Uh, they've, they've, you, you, they've, they've used the same kit, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's the interesting thing. But you know, 
I don't know how many kids are on the sand crawler, like 75. You know, oh, there's 11, like there's 12 pent, there's 12 panther G's, one of the Bandai panther G's, and they're, they're two, 200 pounds, $200 uh, yeah, to find a single one. really pound. messing oh with my, my Wi Fi. Jump on the other Wi Fi. Wow. Yeah, it's because it's really well, the, problem, the, problem with the, the problem with the Panther G's now, John, is it's not even the price, it's trying to find them, right? Yeah, yeah. so even if you have the money to buy them, they're just not as accessible or as available as they used to be. Yeah, no, and I've been um, able to I mean, find you 11 get, of them. get away with the Jag D's somewhat, but you, but nah, you nah. when Chris has learned lately that um, no. you end up just buying more Panther G's anyway. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you need 11, exactly 11 Panther G's just for one specific little engine part that have, you have to have. I've, I've been able to find 11 of them. I, what is it, 12 you need, right? 12 you need, yeah. Yeah. It just takes you, time. You can't, you, you couldn't mold it, cast them. I actually, Chris is very fussy about what he puts on his models, and he likes yes. to stick to styrene. I like to stick to <laughs> styrene. <laughs> I do, I do have a, a certain point. Well, I do have I, a three D print of that. So, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the I thing. Mean, is no, I see all these people. Yeah. yeah. I see a lot of people that are they're three D printing their Greeblies, and I'm like, okay. It's like, it's hard to figure. It's hard to nail down exactly what's the most acceptable thing, the etiquette for this, because some people it's got to be the the kit part. Some people it's okay if it's casting. Some people are doing it three D print and going, they're perfectly fine with it. I'm like, okay, well. I think it's just personal well, preference. What it comes yeah, to I do. find that it's specific I, specific models that I want to keep. You know, yeah. styrene like my sand crawler and slave one. I I just I want them all to be all styrene. I don't want. That's I don't what I was gonna say. You seem to be more. I don't think that it's not necessarily that you're not open minded to it. I think it's very specific models because yes. you 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 are open minded to casting or using three D pieces, but there are certain models you know that you just want hundred percent as accurate as can be. Because there's yeah, even been yeah. times where I'm like. Hey, why don't you try this? Or why don't you try that? And you're like, yeah, sure. But then when it comes to a certain model, you're like, I'd rather not. I'd rather take the time or invest or, you know. And, and you know, I I totally understand that. And I I, I get that, right? Because certain yeah. things are a passion project. Other things are like, okay, this is accessible. I just want to get this done. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. There's a certain thing. Like in... a... Sorry, Jungle. Oh, it's just to say, there's a certain beauty in not building at studio scale and pushing it one way or the other, a little bigger, a little smaller, and just building it all. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I have I have two different size sand crawlers. Mm -hmm. I have a, a one a studio scale size one and half studio scale. So it, a kit, a whole kit, you know, that I built already. I built four wow. of them actually. But um <laughs> yeah, so the big ones taking it's I just realized I'm on a one year anniversary now is when I bought that the that skeleton. So I, yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I've had children since I started mine. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, these things take time. <laughs> we all live, we need to all live to be about 800 to 1,000 years old to, you know, finish everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you always take on more than one project as well. Oh, God, yeah. That's tough. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a lot, it's a lot of fun. I, I'm very glad we got you, we're able to meet you and have you on for the show. It's been, yeah. it's been a blast. I really appreciate yeah. it, and it's fun. It's fun talking to people that are kind of on the same page with this stuff. Do you so. find that you you do, do you do any modeling at home on your own for your own self? Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Whenever whenever I can find the time to do it, you know. Right. That's why I said we all live, need to live to be eight hundred or a thousand years old to get everything done. Yeah. And I realized today. I was telling somebody. I've told the story a couple times lately, but I've got, I think, like ten submarine models that are all between eight and nine feet long. Okay. But I, I realized, so I was telling that story the other day, I actually have 12. And I called Larry Tan up and I said, Larry, I think I'm going out of my mind. I'm like, unless I'm going to open up a submarine museum, what the hell am I doing? He goes, well, <laughs> it's, it's about joy. And I'm like, okay, good. Because I thought it was about losing my damn mind. You know, like, what am I doing? Where are and you going to put all those? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That, that was funny because, well, Greg Jean gave me five of them. And he gave me a nine foot I boat that was a casting of the one from 1941. He gave me two nine foot Gatos that were from virus, then an eight foot Gato, and then a 32nd parallel type seven C German U boat. Nice. So that's half of my collection of giant submarines that, you know, <laughs> and it was, it was interesting, you know, I, I, did any of you, did any of you know, Greg Gene? No. 
Well, not we, we know of him, but we don't yeah, yeah. know him personally. No, it's funny. no he and gave then, me like one said, of the other boxes with the other X-Wing he has. It's in my closet. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's funny because, like I said, I met Greg in 86. And Greg, Greg was a mentor for me the whole time, you know, until he passed away. He passed away about a year and a half ago. Not quite a year and a half ago. But it was really interesting, his auction. It was unbelievable, all the stuff he had. Mm. Yeah, and I remember. Well, I remember talking to Greg and saying, "What, what do you want to? What do you want to have happen? What do you want to do?" And he he did not want to talk about it. And I realized after my conversation with Larry, for Greg it was about joy. It wasn't he didn't want to deal with the mortality or what to do with it. He just loved having it, you know. Yeah. And it left a huge, huge project for his family and friends to deal with. But oh, you know, I, 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 yeah, I get where he was coming from though. The auction catalog from that is well worth getting if you if you can get it. It's amazing. Yeah, I yeah. picked I picked up a I picked up a copy. It's it's always worth it. Well, it's I already know all this. All this is going to my kids. They all know it already. So they all have things picked out. All this is going to them. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. you're it's, it's you're a, lucky. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting thing you brought up, John. Right, it was about Greg saying like at, at at the time right before before his passing, it was something that he just wanted to enjoy. Right, it wasn't yeah. about doing one thing or the other and we've, we've had a few guests and and even people that we haven't talked to directly like you take somebody like us lopez right when you see his collection and we've actually asked him you know it, it's an odd question but you have to say but the question of that magnitude when you pass what happens right especially yeah. if you don't have children and these are these are museum level pieces like so what do you do as a steward of, of these pieces um and then you take somebody like like Adam Savage, if you will, right? Like tested, and you, and you think you know you look at his workspace and you say, well, hey man, if anything goes wrong, like who's who's cleaning this and categorizing it and inventorying it, like the, the, that just <laughs> hurts my know. brain. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it scares me because that that you know a bunch of us are potentially would be the recipients of dealing with that. And it's funny, I mean, thirty two ten is closing, and thirty two ten is the facility where ILM was based in Santa Fe. And it's two buildings that were part of ILM. Um, yeah, somebody just asked about that. Oh yeah, gosh, I'll yeah. be there tomorrow. I'll be over there tomorrow. It's I was over there the other day using the lathe, and I'm like, as I'm turning the handle, the auction tag is whipping by. I'm like, this is really kind of hard to use the equipment with them trying to sell it out from underneath us, you know. But, <laughs> yeah, they had to go get the vacuum. I had to undo the cord, untag it, go do the vacuum, and come back, put the cord all back. Tag it back up, put it back in the Wow, that's but funny. The yeah, vacuum. it seems to have some. Seems to have, they seem to have some pretty, pretty interesting things in those 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 auctions as well. Um, yeah, I mean that that sort of. I mean, it was weird. It was weird because ILM left there 15 years ago, thereabouts. And then when Kerner Optical was there, that was an iteration of it. But when 3210 formed, all this stuff came back. And like even the racks for the material in the wood shop came back. I'm like, where the hell was all this stuff, you know? And <laughs> stage equipment, all kinds of stuff. And it was kind of like, it was kind of like ILM had been hiding in the cracks, and it kind of bled back into the building. So it's been really amazing because Sean House has been running the model shop over there, and he kind of reproduced what used to be called Uptown Model Shop, and okay. it's got the original paint racks. I mean, it's just so much of the original stuff that was that was the ILM model shop. And it's gut wrenching to watch it being sold off like it is. Oh. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, I mean, it's like a fire sale almost. Well, yeah, they they kind of decided about maybe two months ago that they were out by October thirty first. That was it. Right. And Sean's been trying to find different ways to try and save the facility, and they're just they're just is anybody with the pockets that can do it. Mm. So, but and they're you know they're gutting the the C theater. C theater was where. Skywalker Sound did all their initial Foley work. And, you know, it's it's an it's a sound isolated room. It's a beautiful theater. It's a THX theater. And they're gonna destroy that space. They're gonna gut those buildings. And that's the only stage left in Marin County, too. Main stage. That's history, right? That's that's cinematic it's, history right there. It's totally yeah. history. So what are they gonna do? Make apartments there. of it. Okay, make apartments out of commercial, it. Commercial commercial space. It can be warehouse yeah. or office or yeah. whatever. It'll like it'll be a Chipotle or a Starbucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. It's it's a damn shame because it's you know. And Sean had organized historic tours there that Lucasfilm licensed. 
and we oh, were able wow. to do okay. one of those the day before the lockdown. And that would have been a really interesting thing. You know, I think people yeah. come from all over wanted to, would, would want to do that. So yeah, it's really sad to see it go. It was really good facility and we did so many things there and you walk in on the stage and it's just like, God, I've got memories of a hundred different projects in there. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, I have a question for you. Do you ever get to yeah. go to um, the archives to look at some of the older pieces and, you know, go build things kind of like it or imitate it or something like that? Mm, I get, to, I go to the archives pretty regularly. Do yeah. Do you? Okay, cool. Yeah. So, but you know, you take and some I, pictures for us. <laughs> I don't think they'll allow that anymore. Uh, not um, anymore, no. Yeah, it's changed. It's changed hands, kind of. There's but, a couple um, spots on the sand crawler and slave one we need to know about. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, What's that model I, behind you? Oh, that that is that was a building from a Charles Barkley versus Godzilla commercial. Oh, okay. Oh my God, I remember that. Okay. Yeah. And I think, I don't know what that dome at the top's from. The helicopter is from our first Union commercial. There's a ship back there that's from Next Generation from season six. And there's okay. a Bat Mirror from Batman Returns and a, a Raiders Idol. But well, I'm going to, I'd like to, I'd like to ask something that I, I ask people sometimes. The first time you saw your work on screen, I mean, I know it probably never gets old, but what was that, what was that first like visceral reaction like? It's that that thing that I built is not that's not the same one that's on screen. Some magical process happened inside the camera. That's something different. When it appears on screen, that is uh, magically becomes something else. I remember really having that feeling on Back to the Future 2, looking at stuff and just going, that that's just not possible. That that's <laughs> I just that's just you know I still have moments like that. It was funny because we were laying on the couch watching Mandalorian and the ship went by. Anytime you saw it in space, it was the miniature. I said, That is so weird that came from the garage downstairs and there it goes zooming <laughs> through space on tv i'm like that's really weird yeah that's gonna so, be it's gonna be trippy right yeah i don't oh. think i've ever gotten i don't think i don't think you get over that it's just kind no, of amazing I'm sure you don't i yeah. know i wouldn't i wouldn't so i was gonna ask you john so you you build now currently from your own place is that right you, you mm -hmm. don't work from a studio well i was using 3210 well, like yeah. I said, though they're they're taking it apart around us while we're trying to do stuff, but you know, <laughs> so that's that. You know, thirty two ten was a great space to have because you know we had a machine shop, we had a full size wood shop, spurry booth. You know, we had all the things we needed, vacuum floor machines, and so I would do a certain amount of it there, but mostly I would work out of my own garage. And so there are a handful of us that were at thirty two ten that are looking for a new space potentially. Okay. So that's all sort of in its gestation at this point. We've set aside a certain amount of the tools and equipment and we're giving ourselves six months to find another location and kind of get set up. So hopefully we'll get some. Oh, nice. Well, see, there you go, Chris, even the ILM guys are working in their garage like us. <laughs> well, that's well, what the, thing, yep. <laughs> the Ahsoka press release. It says the ILM model shop. And I'm like, that's kind of scratching it a little bit. <laughs> 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 but as you were saying because, that, the first thing that crossed my mind was, the accessibility, the, you know, utilize utilization of the tools and, and everything that, you know, you don't want to sort of overcrowd your own home space or garage space with is one thing and working from home is good, but there's going to be times where you miss the element of being able to, like we were saying, like, you know, we jump on video calls and bounce ideas off each other, oh, but yeah. you, you, nothing can replace the element of working with and, you know, kind of putting heads together and sharing ideas and, you know, that's, that's the tough part. Well, you know, the, the ILM model shop, you know, like I said, I got there in 88. And, you know, several, a lot of people had already come and gone. But we, you know, over, over the you know the course of time, we acquired new people and stuff. And it was, but it was very familial. We all still get together. We're all, a bunch of us are going camping this weekend. You know, but it's kind of like, I'm as connected to those people. I'm more connected to those people than a good deal of my family. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and there are connections there that, you know, for me, they're 35 years almost, I think, or maybe it is 35, but you know, I mean that you work together so intensely and mm -hmm. on such cool stuff and, you know, and I, I just, you know, sometimes you're there, sometimes you're there around the clock, you know, together and you're just 
crammed in there doing this stuff. And, and it was kind of one of those things that if people didn't get along, they didn't tend to last. Right. Because it was so intense and, and you had to be able to count on the people around you to do their jobs and, you know, know that's High stakes. Happen. Yeah. yeah so. we, we always say it takes, takes a, a whole crew to build one model, even just one in your garage. Yeah. Like, like the four of us, we, there's a lot of things I wouldn't have been able to do or think about or figure out on my own. The, it, the fact that I had the other guys help me to do yeah. that yeah. was priceless, you know? So yeah, we, yours is on we a grander would get a, scale. We would get a lot of questions on some of our more <laughs> casual shows. And as Chris said, like I used to say all the time, quote unquote, it takes a village. It really does. Because yeah. even, yeah. even to hone your skills, right? Sometimes when you think, Hey, I'm pretty good at this. You know, I get this down. Then you realize somebody else has a different technique or a different way of doing it that may be more efficient or a little bit more cleaner or smoother. And, and there's so many things that you can continue to, to, to take from. And, and also just everybody has a specialty. Like, you know, you, you get John with the way he paints and, you know, just all these different elements that you can borrow from and, and, and pick from. And, and that's the thing that I, I think is, is sometimes the hardest, but like you said, you're in a situation at times where a lot of these, a, a lot of these, times basically are like the 11th hour right like get it done get it on screen yeah. get you know you as a model maker and as a creative when you want to just put that extra little detail and clean this up here like it, you know it, it's it's gotta like go against everything in you because it's like nope like get it out get it get it on you know get it shot yeah. and uh you know that's the tough part like you said it's it's high stakes it can get very tense and you know hopefully you're with the right people and in the right environment yeah well there's also i mean there's there are two different modes i mean there's that kind of mode and then when I'm building something for myself, I'll tend to, you know, I'll do those things. And sometimes you wind up having the time to do finesse things and add details and stuff like that on some of the film jobs. Mm -hmm. But so much of the time, we would spend so much time worrying about something. I remember, like, on Die Hard 2, we had these big airplane models that were, we had these DC-8s that were 21 feet long. And, you know, Tim Greenwood had spent all this time painting them, and the pirate guys had rigged them and everything. And the first time we went to shoot, one of them we had it drop down on wires and it was supposed to hit the ground and skid and the wings were supposed to ignite and the wings were supposed to come off and the fuselage was going to skid further down the runway and then we were going to blow it up with more models progressively and instead the first time we did it it was all loaded with pyro and stuff and it came down the cables but they had it attached to a pickup truck except they didn't attach to the pickup truck so when they yelled action and the truck took off the plane didn't do anything for a while and then eventually the plane came down the wires and it kind of got to the ground and it just kind of crunched itself and broke and sat there and we're like well, what the hell is that and they're like <laughs> you know and, and it's loaded with explosives it's like you know but we had to go out and kind of fix the flaps and the landing because it was all broken from it just crunching it so we're kind of fixing all that stuff and the wing got turned and so we're taking silver gaffers tape and we're going around the wing route you know we're taking black spray paint spray and stuff and i'm like we spent all that time making it look perfect and here's the shot we could have painted a grocery bag and blown it up and it would look as bad as, you know. <laughs> so there was a lot of that where you just kill yourself on all these details and then ultimately what winds up on screen, you're like, whatever, you know, it doesn't matter. But but I remember on Star Trek six, we had gotten the Excelsior and the Excelsior was built for Star Trek three. And I don't know if it got, it was in four, I think briefly. And then it may have been used on the TV shows and whatnot, but you know, these models weren't built to last forever. So we get it for Star Trek six and the mount doors, they're all broken and the screws are stripped and it was like, it's falling apart. And that model, whenever we do the light pass, we have to go with black tape and put black tape without disturbing the model, put black tape over all these light leaks. So it's just covered in black tape and then take it all back off without moving anything. But the oh, wow. mount doors are all coming off and we're cutting a piece of white paper tape, sticking them on it. It looked like crap. There's a shot in Star Trek six where it comes right by camera. And that mount door goes by camera. It looks perfect. And I'm like, holy crap. That's that magical process that happens where I'm like, it looked like garbage in person, but on screen it looks perfect. So, you know, yeah, I don't quite understand what happened there, but, you know, I knew what it looked that's like always, when I see the shot. That's always interesting. When we show pictures of real models, um, whether we're going over, like, auctions or, you know, whatever it may be, or just pulling up reference images, and some of the people that, like, you know, whether they're buying, you know, commission models or, you know, mass produced models and then they see the real thing and they're like does, does it really look that bad uh, is it is it really in that bad shape yeah. the colors really this grimy and it's like well yeah they didn't have 
six months or nine months to sit and meticulously, you know, detail it. Yeah. Like, no, they had to get it to where they needed to get it to. And I think it's it's surprising. You know, it, it it's sometimes jarring because, like you said, or there's that trickery of how you see it on camera, you know, the, 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 the cleanup and the editing and all that, where you know personally that, like, hey, I put this thing right before it went on camera, how janky and it was on its last leg. And then now it looks like this beautiful piece. And it, it, I think it's real interesting, you know, to kind of connecting or disconnecting the two. Uh, but I, I always find that 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 to be, uh, you know, surprise. It never it never fails to surprise me. Well, it's John, funny. I do. A, nope. Have you yeah. ever had a, a a home one moment where you know, like home one, it's painted so intricately and all these different colors and all these different shapes, and they spent so much time on it, and then it's a blink if you miss it. Have you ever? Had a ship where you just went to town on it, and then it barely got shown. You're just like, oh well, why do I waste all my time on that thing like that? Oh, there've been plenty of times we built stuff and it never got, it never got seen. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess that'd be worse. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like you know, it's it's. Kinda, I remember I was working on the, um, God, what was it with Jim Carrey, the Truman Show, okay. and there was a shot he wanted to go to Fiji. And so they were like, so, the, you know, in the story, they buy this old airliner and they pick it up with a crane and they bounce it around and, and they set it down in this Fiji world that's next to Truman world. And, and that's, you know, that's that thing. So I, they bought an eight, it's like an eight foot electric RC plane. And I don't know, the BAE, I think, makes the plane. It's a high wing four engine. It kind of looks like a C-17, but it's a smaller version that's like for commercial, like 50 seat passenger plane. So they bought a bead foam version of that. And I learned a really painful lesson on that. So I took it and I used spray glue and I put glass cloth down on it, got it all perfect. And I mixed up epoxy and I painted it on there. But the epoxy was just regular viscosity. Well, the epoxy ran and dripped and did all kinds of things. Well, there's no way to sand that back out because the epoxy is harder than the foam underneath. So I went yeah. to put about a gallon and a half of Bondo on that thing to build it out so I could smooth it out because it went up with an aluminum skin. So it's all gotta be pretty clean. <laughs> Yeah. So built the thing and then built these cradles for it. And it was, I think it was Hanover airlines and uh, built the cradles and the crane arm and all that stuff. And they shot the elements and I go see the movie and I'm like watching it. And he, at one point Truman runs into this travel agency and there's a poster of a DC eight or a seven Oh seven on the wall being struck by lightning from multiple places. And he kind of goes, <gasps> and he runs out. That's the only airplane in the movie. The credits are rolling. I'm like, well, what happened to the airplane scene? It's not in there. It's so in there. you can see the footage on, it's on YouTube somewhere. And then the model of the plane got donated to the Academy. So the Academy Museum has it. And they don't know what to do with it because it was not in the movie. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the odd thing is, here's an odd thing. There was a, the symbol on the side of the plane was Mercury. The God Mercury was his head with his helmet with the wings on it. And for whatever reason, that has been in the door jam of whatever truck I've had since the man since that show. So it's in my <laughs> truck outside right now. So kind of interesting. It's with me every day. Nice, nice. But, but yeah, didn't didn't make it in the movie. <laughs> I got an interesting. I got an interesting question. I always wanted to ask, and um, this is something that always crosses my mind whenever whenever we're talking to somebody because it's hard to imagine. But if you weren't doing this, right? Like if you weren't doing models, working in, in movies, and but no. yeah. what 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 would you be doing? That's a really interesting question because I I was I was on a path from age five. You know, this was it. This was all I wanted to do. So I don't know. I mean, I got a guy, a friend who does yeah. aircraft and helicopters for film, full size ones, and he's always offered me a job. I mean, I'm gonna go do that. But I don't I don't know. It's a really good question because I I knew what I wanted to do when I was. 55 years ago, I knew what I wanted to do. That's, that's so. amazing. A lot of times when people say that, like it, it, it was, it's this or bust, like that's it. Yeah. Right. If I yeah. hook up my correct, this is what I'm going to do. Nine out of 10 times. It, it sounds so cliche. Right. But it's true. Nine out of 10 times that's what that person ends up, ends up doing. So yeah, that's, that's why I, it is a difficult right. question because it's hard to see yourself not doing that. Yeah. And it's weird. It's weird watching some like 30 to 10 close. Cause it's kind of, it's a pretty big door shutting with that going away because that's the yeah. last vestige of that original ILM facility. It's funny. I had a, I've got a 10 foot uh, replica of the Luxembourg from Rocketeer. That's mm -hmm. kind of been in that Kerner complex since I built it. 
20, whenever it was, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And we moved it over to ILM two weekends ago. So okay. it's now hanging in the stairwell over at ILM. But that was kind of weird, finally taking it out of there. So and it doesn't get God, auctioned off. Yeah, well, that, that and thank God it didn't come yeah. home. Yeah. It went, there was a place for it to go to ILM. <laughs> Do you have a, a separate collection room where you display your models? No. No. Okay. Yeah. I wish I did. Yeah. yeah. My, my house is, there are models everywhere, and my garage looks like, somebody said, what's your garage like? I'm like, well, imagine a dumpster that's kind of like Swiss cheese. There are holes in it where you can kind of go through it, but it's just full of stuff. There's stuff everywhere. Oh, so. it's easy to get completely messy. I, at my workshop, I have it. I end up working on a space maybe this big after I'm like so do I. sitting stuff. Yeah, so do I. I have to take every half hour and just clean it all up, and then five minutes later, I get back to this again. You know, yeah, no, you have tables, tables, and tables of space, and but then it encloses around you, and you look up, and you've just got boxes around you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's funny. Yeah. I, I built a three. It's about a three and a half foot lunar module, and I, I started looking around like, how the hell did I make this in here? There's nowhere to make it, you know, because I'm, like, I'm working on the same thing. It's like the, the, the desk space is like the size of a shoe. That's that's the amount of surface I've got to work on still. It's like, and Steve Golly was over here, and he was standing in the garage, and he said, where'd you build that starter story? I'm like, where you're standing. He goes, no, but where'd you build it? I'm like, right where you're standing. This is it, Steve. This is it. This is all the space there is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fucking uh, endogenous. Hmm? Well, this is a, this is a pretty good place for us to stop, I think. Uh, I'd love to actually talk out off camera with you about a bunch of stuff if you have time. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, it, I think this is a good place. So uh, I want to thank you, John, so much for, for joining us. This was great. Uh, I, oh, yeah, my I pleasure. Be... And, John, thanks for being up so early. Uh, no, no, anytime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd love to have you, you back, John. Late. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure John will get up again if if you jump on. So yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I, too. And I can call and wake him up early in the morning for once this time. So. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this has been great. I, I this has been a lot of fun, and um, we will definitely have to do this again. But uh, don't go anywhere. Don't hang up. Don't push okay. anything. We'll 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 keep talking. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank Thanks you, for everybody. Me. Thanks for joining us. Yes, See ya.